give two introductions. And the first introduction will be a, a segment of Julie introducing you in her own words. Because if I tried to do it in my words, I would just do it in a much more awkward way. And then what I'm going to do in the second part is try to give a brief reprise of the contributions that Julie made to the language sciences in her uh, scientific work at Rochester and then at Brown. Because I think it's, uh, I want to try to give you a sense of just the influence she had and, and uh, the nature of the work she did. So, in Julie's work, Julie Sedevi is a hybrid academic and writer who is obsessed, who is obsessed with language and all its facets. On her way to a conventional writing career, she was sidelined by taking a linguistics course, which introduced her to the scientific study of language. This proved too much to resist. She went on to earn a PhD in linguistics from the University of Rochester, where she was involved in pioneering research in the United States spoken language company. She subsequently joined the faculty at Brown University for 12 years and has published more than 30 scientific articles in language and mind. But on her way to a conventional academic career, a funny thing happened. She indulged in some non-academic writing, and this too proved too much to resist. She now spends much of her time writing for general audiences, often on themes related to language. She's the lead author of the popular science book, Sold on Language, How Advertisers Talk to You and What This Says About You, and it's written for publications such as Nautilus, Scientific American, Discover, and the popular blog, Language Blog. In addition to writing for general audiences, she works with scientific, scientist authors to help them make their work accessible and riveting to normal people. Now, I'm going to, I encourage you to read the whole bio from Julie's webpage subscribes for other activities, uh, her poetry, her, uh, other, her uh, book that's forthcoming, and a whole range of things. Uh, and I'll end by saying, uh, I'll skip that because of time, and say, uh, end by saying, Julie's made numerous appearances, again I'm reading, as a media commentator on CBC and NTR, she occasionally rents out her brain and expertise as a consultant to commercial and nonprofit entities. If she really likes you, she might dispense bursts of knowledge or advice for free. Unless <laughs> you, you, you think she's a saint, we are paying her. Okay, now, part two of the introduction. And I apologize for taking this much of her time. But the landscape in psycholinguistics is very different today than it was when Julie entered the field. Consider the following scenario. A landscape designer walks into a garden and sees a big rock. He wonders why it was placed there. Should it be moved? Should he build around it? How will his client feel about that? Now, all very reasonable. Now, a vision scientist suggests to his colleagues that all of the conceptual processing I've described is part and parcel of recognizing that object is a rock. All that stuff is intrinsic to basic vision. Seems a bit far-fetched. Not even. Well, we now take it for granted that as we understand the speaker, we consider her intentions, why she is saying what she's saying, including the context and how she said it. We don't know exactly how this works, but nearly everyone takes it for granted that we should study it and that it's closely integrated with other aspects of language processing, like picking out possible words, word objects, from the speech stream. But when Julie entered the field, the claim, that claim, was about as implausible to many language scientists as the rock vision example. So, Julie's work played a primary, arguably the primary, role in changing the landscape. Here's how she did it. It's actually very simple and very ingenious. Okay. It starts with the basic observation that linguists had built forming models about. Big rocks are different than big cupcakes. <laughs> Size depends, and that adjective depends on what it is modifying. To many, that suggested that one can't even interpret a word like big until you know what big is modifying. Okay. So, what Julie did was put objects in 
uh, in front of people and say, give them instructions why touch the big cupcake. And if there were two cupcakes, one big, one little, and a much bigger rock, people would immediately look at the big cupcake because why would someone be saying big if, a, uh, if there were not multiple objects? And in fact, people were looking at the cupcake before the end of the, uh, uh, the, end of the word big. Okay, now, ingenious shows you are interpreting big in a context taking into account the objects. But there's a story you can tell that doesn't require bringing lots of communicative intentions, thinking about why someone is saying what they're doing into the picture. You say big is a special kind of <coughs> linguistic form. It's a, a scale, technical term is scalar. Linguists have talked about that. Truly being a linguist knew about it. And that particular type of word does a particular type of work, so integrating the context into the word can be done by this particular type of word. What Julie went on, and so that changes the story, but it doesn't, not in the, in the, rat, in the really radical way. What she did next was say, ah, let's really ask whether it is just that word or whether you're really bringing in the communicative intentions and so on. And she did that in a couple of ways, but basically what she showed is that these effects, number one, are not limited to these particular kinds of adjectives that have a particular kind of analysis. It depends on at least two important factors. One factor is whether it would make sense to Mod to add an adjective in a particular context, but it also depends on the way the particular speaker uses language in order to convey their intentions. In other words, we need to bring all of that, like in the landscape rock example, into the process of understanding how it is that language is processed. And so, in effect, Julie's work and moved the landscape su such that we language scientists now assume that rich communicative intentions are integrated with things as basic as picking out words in the speech stream. And that shows a way in which someone with an ingenious mind who crosses boundaries can solve problems in kind of a, a simple but incisive way. And uh, the field is dramatically changed. I've talked far too long to the session. <laughs>
an impact on non-scientists that we might not anticipate. So I don't know how many of you actually interact with non-scientists on a daily basis. It's a really useful thing to do because you realize that, hmm, there are things that we think are okay and they don't think are okay. For example, the title of a paper that I was reading once was picked up by someone close to me who is not a scientist. And on reading the title, he threw the paper down and said, why do they have to write like this? So <laughs> this is the objectionable title. Mind reading, communication, and the learning of names from names. What's wrong with it is, why did this author feel he had to say the learning of names for things? This is uh, unbearably ponderous. Since this interaction, I've noticed that there are a number of other uh, reactions that people have to language, not just in a scientific context, but often in other contexts that I spend a lot of time in. For example, in poetry. So non-poets often really dislike poetry, I learned to my great surprise. <laughs> um, evidently, someone wrote a letter to the poet Billy Collins saying, whenever I read a modern poem, it feels like I'm in the pool with my brother's foot on the back of my neck. <laughs> Maybe an experience that you have. And a blogger for The Atlantic, Noah Berlatsky, accused several prominent poets of applying their wit and humor in a way designed to alienate as large a public as possible. So, believe it or not, there are people out there who think you are writing the way you are writing you know, because you are trying to alienate them. Um, I happen to not think that's true. But if we start looking at what academic language looks like to the outside eye, I think we might have a better sense of why someone would feel it. So here's an example of a very, very typical piece of text that you might come across. I'm not going to read this out, I'm just going to let you read some of the first sentences. Okay, perfectly clear, right? <laughs> well, it's clear to me. Um, I don't see anything wrong with it as a scientist. This is very easy to interpret. But it's not easy to for someone else to interpret, as you can see if you look at the translation of this. So what I've done is looked at the journal article and matched it up with an explanation to a general audience that appeared in Scientific American. This is what that language looks like. Okay, so it feels quite different uh, as something to read. Um, and if you go back to the original academic text, you start noticing that there's all kinds of structures that writing coaches will often say you really should be avoiding. So, for example, uh, passive structures. I love the first sentence here because it really packs them in. There's <laughs> two back to back after performance improvement has been maximized is called overlearning. Right? Let's really put them on top of each other. Uh, we also get. Uh, dense clauses jammed together into a single sentence. And we get lots of jargon and so-called weak words, really abstract words. Right? So you can start picking this apart from the perspective of a typical writing coach and thinking, of, don't do that. Now, I think there's a reason why this kind of writing exists. I think in this context, it's really interesting to look at some very, very interesting work that's been done by linguists Doug Biber and um, Bethany Gray, where they've actually looked at uh, comparisons of academic writing and journalistic writing for its stylistic traits. And one of the things that they find is that, in particular, nominalizations, so nouns made out of other kinds of categories, uh, are really prominent in academic writing, especially in scientific writing. And even more so, complex noun phrases, or what I like to call very technically as noun piles. So here are examples of noun piles that appear. And if you look at the alternative way of restating it, right, the alternatives basically pick apart the relationships between the nouns and make them explicit. Um, so one of the things that you might notice is that it takes a lot more space to unpack these noun piles than to just use the noun piles. Um, so you might get a sense of why these might have evolved in scientific writing. In some cases, the meanings of these are quite easy to infer, in some cases less, 
But even when they're easy to infer, they're not what we would call as linguists compositional, in the sense that the meaning is not transparent based on the meaning of the individual words and the structure that puts them together. And you can see the problems you might run into by looking at an example of a failure to translate by Google. So here's an example of a noun pile that didn't translate to <laughs> 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 so the proliferation of noun piles uh, apparently uh, continues to increase over time. So we see many more of these in scientific writing now than we used to see 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Try reading the original work of Charles Darwin, right? and it looks, sounds incredibly transparent to you or I. Right? Try reading a current biology textbook, much less so. Um, what they've also found is that these stylistic, stylistic traits are concentrated in the sciences relative to the humanities, and even more concentrated in journals that speak to a very specialized scientific audience as opposed to a more general journal like science. Moreover, they find that when they look at the writing of undergraduates who are science majors, they learn to use these stylistic traits. This is not something that scientists do simply because they haven't been trained to write properly. It's something that scientists learn to do as part of their academic trajectory. So I think that puts it into a very different light. Um, and it suggests that those of us who are very specialized scientists, as sciences, really need to pay attention to this because we are using a style of language that is really deviant from many other ways of expression. And I think this can kind of trigger some of that anger and hostility that we see from non-scientists. So just to kind of capture maybe the expression that someone might feel from the outside, I think that some of the styles of expression we have um, are very similar to experiments that have been done in psycholinguistics using images like this. <laughs> so some of you might be familiar with the Tangram experiments. The way they work is like this. We have uh, two people interacting with each other. Uh, we have these bizarre shapes made out of 10 gram units, and the goal is for the person speaking to communicate what the object they're referring to is um, to the other person. And what you find is that at first people start off with quite elaborate, unpacked descriptions. So if you look at, say, the figure um, second from the left, they might say something like, the thing that looks a little bit like a, a magician waving his arms, wearing a robe. Okay, so you're able to pick that out. On subsequent turns, when presented with the same objects, these expressions get shorter and shorter and less elaborated. So over time, people might say, uh, the guy that looks like a magician, or eventually just the magician. Now, you can imagine an outsider coming in at a later stage of the development of these interactions, uh, and being told, you know, find the magician, not so clear. So these can become impenetrable. They serve a function, right? They're not inept descriptions. They're highly effective, efficient descriptions within this context, within this community of speakers. But on the outside, people are coming in, and they have not been part of developing this contract of how we're going to refer to things, and, and especially highly abstract ideas. And I think that that alienation comes not just from feeling that you can't understand it, but also from some of the sociolinguistic aspects of language, right? So that title I started with is not just difficult to understand. I don't think there's anything difficult to understand about it. But the reader was reacting to the sense that um, the scientist was using the language as a way to signal that they were somehow elevated above the general public. And that sort of triggers a sense of, I'm on the outside of this social group. So I think that's kind of rolled into that experience as well. So that addresses what I see as the modest goal for science writers. That is, don't be the worst possible kind of science writer for a public. Try to avoid alienating your audience, goal number one. Um, and I think if you accomplish this, that's already a big accomplishment. But in the rest of this talk, I'm going to try to encourage you to think a little bit more ambitiously and to think about how scientists might be the best possible <coughs> science writers and not the worst. 
um, and to think about what it is that scientists have to contribute to writing about science that journalists can't, that other kinds of writers can't. Um, and I think one of these goals is that we need writing about science to represent the true diversity of our scientific community, to really represent who scientists are. And I'm not talking here just about diversity of gender, ethnicity, or culture and all that. I'm also talking about diversity of intellectual style and temperament and attitude. So I think that any time a group is viewed from the outside, uh, there's a tendency to view members of that group as much more uniform and homogenous than they are. Uh, and if we look at public portrayals of scientists, they often trade in stereotypes. So for example, we have the mad scientist trope. Right? Uh, this is an individual who is the non-conforming genius, who pushes against the scientific establishment, breaks all the social norms along the way, and makes the surprising discovery, you know, resisting against all of his colleagues and uh, what's been known to so that's one type of stereotype that's highly inaccurate. Another example, I think, is the plotting methodical scientist, the data-driven drone who's passionless and without imagination. And we know that these guys are passionless and without imagination because they've been stripped of any uniquely identified markers, her hair is up and back, and they look as bland as possible. <laughs> And I think it's very easy for young people or anyone to look at these stereotypes and not recognize themselves at all. Not see the connection between themselves and scientists. Or not see themselves as potential scientists. But in reality, if we look around at the colleagues around us, so for instance, uh -huh. um, we know that scientific contributions can be made and are made by all kinds of models. So for example, we have the scientists who love to live in abstraction and who can take really murky ideas and distill them into elegant models. Um, or we have the scientists who are design geniuses who can translate abstractions, hammer them out into very specific scenarios in the form of experimental designs and make actual precise predictions. We might have the scientists who have a lifetime of observation about the object of their passion. So maybe they've spent every single minute that they've had staring at bugs or birds. Um, we might have the computer wizards who can develop techniques for analyzing data or approaching new methods. Uh, we might have people who are really, really good at building relationships, who are able to do things, for example, like gain access to remote populations or garner resources that get scientific projects started off the ground. So all of these kinds of aptitudes, experiences, are really relevant for science. And I don't think that the general public has a sense of the richness of them. I think a second reason why scientists need to be speaking to non-scientists -science is that they can serve as really important role models for what it's like to live with chaos and uncertainty and still continue to try to make sense of the world. Uh, I think we're living in a complexity crisis right now where we have the sense as a culture that the world is so complicated and the solutions that we need to arrive at are so complicated that for many people this just causes them to retreat into the simplest kind of solutions that are offered. <coughs> so they're really vulnerable to overthinking. But I think scientists should think not just about communicating the products of their science, but also how they arrive at that science. So what does it mean, for example, to be a scientist who starts breaking into a problem that seems completely impenetrable? Where do you start with that? How do you decide to invest your resources where you think, but you're not sure, you will learn something useful? What do you do with data that seems contradictory? How do you know how confident you can be in your results? How do you, what do you do when you get results that run against what you expected to see, or even worse, what you really, really in your heart of hearts wanted to see? Um, what personal qualities did you have to cultivate or suppress, for that matter, in order to become a truth seeker? And what qualities tripped you up along the way? So I think that these are all the really important things to 
uh, think about and to be able to communicate to the world. But if we take this much more ambitious view, that we're not just turning our conference abstracts and presentations into more accessible and easier language, but that we're really contributing something very unique to science writing or science communication, uh, then you're confronted with the fact that we need to acquire some new skills as scientists that maybe are not currently part of our toolkit. So, um, I think we need to move away from some of those practices where we're simply making our sentences transparent and think about creating language that really connects with people, maybe that convinces them that they want to read about something they did not know they were interested in before they encountered a piece of writing. Um, and that, quite frankly, I'm here to tell you, is not easy. So I'm going to start by showing you examples of science writing just a little excerpt that I think do this well. So here's an excerpt um, by Hope Yaron, writing about botany. In order to accumulate all of the soil nutrients that 35 pounds of leaves require, our tree must first absorb and then evaporate at least 8,000 gallons of water from the soil. That's enough to fill a tanker truck. That's enough to keep 25 people alive for a year. That's enough to make you worry about when it's next going to rain. So a number of things going on in this passage that I think are really skillful. So she manages to get out the statistic for you. Okay, we've got the facts. But then in a series of sentences, she makes that statistic visual and accessible. She uses a sentence pattern that has a rhythm to it that draws you in. So this is some of the magic of good writing. And then, She's able to shift your perspective and put you inside the tree and experience the anxiety that a tree might feel when it's <clears throat> dependent on moisture for its existence. Here's another example. Talking about the difficulty of turning abstraction into something we can grasp. Whenever we talk about time, we do so in terms of something lesser. We find or lose time like a set of keys, we save and spend it like money. Time creeps, crawls, flies, please, flows, and stands still. It is abundant or scarce. It weighs on us with palpable heft. Bells toll for a long or short time, as if their sound could be measured with a ruler. Childhood recedes, deadlines loom. The contemporary philosophers George Lakoff and Mark Johnson have proposed a thought experiment. Take a moment and try to address time strictly in its own terms, stripped of any metaphor. You'll be left empty-handed. So this is language that really embodies a very abstract concept in a way that I think can not only be understood, but felt and um, really appreciated by them. One more example by a scientist writing about cancer. To cure cancer, if it could be cured at all, the doctors had only two strategies, excising the tumor surgically or incinerating it with radiation, a choice between the hot ray and the cold night. So a beautifully balanced sentence, that mid-sentence does this really interesting perspective shift. In the first half, we have fairly technical and scientific language. Here we're in the perspective of the scientist. But then we move outside of that perspective into the perspective of the patient who is literally experiencing the consequences of what this physician is about to do to them. Right, so this is incredibly skillful and incredibly hard to do. And uh, I think we learn a lot from uh, people who have spent their lives honing this craft, whether in a scientific context or not. So anytime I need to be reminded of how much I still have to learn as a writer, I pull this book off my shelf, one of the most useful books in my library. It's a book of sentences, literally, it's a book of sentences. Here is the table of contents. Sentences are characterized by the type of sentence structure that they, they exemplify. Um, and what she's done is collected examples of sentences of various structures where the author has managed to control uh, some aspect of structure and, and use it very, very well. And often these are things that you might have been taught by a writing coach aiming for simplicity to avoid. So you might have heard, try to avoid ad adverbs or sort of redundant little bits of noise in your writing. But 
in this sentence, they're not redundant at all. They do a lot of the work. So we have a sentence like, he drank eagerly, copiously, the limping earnestness of his speech disappeared. He talked as he drank abundantly. And that abundance is contributed by the adverbs itself. Here's a terrible structure made beautiful. Taking out my pen, I did in blue, on a bare patch between two seraphic swirls of lipstick, dare set my name. So we have a structure that psycholinguists have described as extremely difficult to process. But here the author has put it to good use to delay information that he wants you to anticipate and have some building for. You might have been told to avoid passives, but this one does a lot of work. By the husbands of his wife's friends, Graham was considered lucky. So we have not only a passive, but an interesting movement of structure to the beginning of the sentence. Quite difficult to process, but there's a payoff here to doing that work that makes it worthwhile. Another one, the town was occupied, the defender defeated, and the war finished by John Steinbeck. Now, try turning this into the so-called preferable active voice, and you destroy the sentence. So these are people who have really mastered uh, the craft of um, manipulating language for the purpose of drawing the reader in, making a connection, holding their attention, giving them a sense of pleasure, all of which are really important, I think, if you're going to be trying to make your work attractive to not now, I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to write like this. Many people will not. Many of you might not even resonate to language like this. You might find it overly precious or overly wrought, and that's not your style. So that's not what I'm trying to communicate. But what I'm trying to suggest is that to really make a connection with your audience, you are going to have to locate within yourself a way of speaking that is unique to you and that allows the reader to make a strong connection so I'm going to pull up a quote that is from all uh, people uh, by Thomas Merton, a Benedictine monk. And this is one of the things that he said. Many poets are not poets for the same reason that many religious men are not saints. They never get around to being the particular poet or the particular monk they are intended to be by God. They never become the man or the artist or the artist who is called for by all the circumstances of their individual lives. They waste their years in vain efforts to be some other poet, some other saint. So I'm going to leave aside for the moment the question of whether you think God has any particular intention for you. <laughs> but I think we can all relate to the idea that there's some person we are meant to be. And you might have a sense of who you are meant to be as a scientist that draws on your particular <coughs> life experiences, uh, aptitudes, and what you resonate to per personally. And I think the same is true of writing. And it's a question of really finding that place uh, that you can communicate from. Uh, and to become that, the kind of writer that you are meant to be might in some cases mean that you break away from some advice that maybe is useful but not useful for you. So for me, that has been uh, the emphasis that I see in a lot of talk about the importance of story. So when journalists talk about making science interesting to the public, they often really emphasize story in a narrative arc. So writers of literary um, journalism, I think, are often indoctrinated a little bit with the idea that the story, hopefully with living, breathing, snorting, characters that lock horns with each other is one of the engines that moves nonfiction on its track, right, from here to there. Uh, and that it's a really good way of taking an abstraction and making it into something more interesting and satisfying. But that emphasis has always made me personally a little bit squeamish, in part because I think it's subject to abuse. Like you, you might be so enamored of a particular narrative art that you start maybe making decisions that favor the story, but that don't really do service to some of the content that you're trying to get across. Uh, there are absolutely cases of these kinds of abuses within the journalistic literature. Um, came across a fascinating and horrifying mm -hmm. book by uh, John Degatta, who, uh, for some reason, that was mysterious to me, decided it would be a good idea 
to publish his correspondence with a fact checker at a magazine he wrote for, where he took a great number of liberties with the facts, and the fact checker would come back and question things, and John Degetta would argue as to why it was important for this fact to be altered to fit the story. And at one point, he said, look, I'm not running for public office here. I'm trying to write something interesting. So I think that this kind of style has the potential to pit the interesting against uh, the true. And I find myself often resisting it. Um, so it also forces you often into a set of narrow templates. So if you listen to some workshops in fiction writing, for example, you might have been told that really there are just a few basic plots. You know, for example, the quest, the rags to riches story, the overcoming the monster story, and so on. All of these plots can really be distilled into one idea, which is that someone wants something very badly, but they're having trouble getting it. <laughs> <laughs> which is useful. This can be a very useful way to approach your writing. And for some of you, and for some content you want to write about, it might be a very good starting point. Um, but again, I think that it favors some content over others. Uh, so I think that's really a great starting point if you're writing, for instance, about this particular scientist who's named Jaroslav Pleger. And he's the subject of a piece that appeared in The Atlantic titled your cat is making you crazy. And he's a great subject because he's a wonderful character. So here's how he is described. No one would accuse Jaroslav Flager of being a conformist. A self-described sloppy dresser, the 53-year-old Czech scientist has the contemplative air of someone habitually lost in thought, and his still youthful square-jawed face is framed by frizzy red hair that encircles his head like a ring of fire. Certainly, Flager's thinking is jarringly unconventional. So here we have the mild scientist trope making its way in. Right? Starting in the early 1990s, he began to suspect that a single-celled parasite in the protozoan family was subtly manipulating his personality, causing him to behave in strange, often self-destructive ways. And if it was messing with his mind, he reasoned, it was probably doing the same to others. For example, he says, he thought nothing of crossing the street in the middle of dense traffic, and if cars honked at me, I didn't jump out of the way. He also made no effort to hide his scorn for the communists who ruled Czechoslovakia for most of his early adulthood. It was very risky to speak your mind openly at the time, he says. I was lucky I wasn't imprisoned. So here we have a really great kind of character as material for the, for the writer. But you know, I have to say that if I were a journalist, assigned a story about this subject. <laughs> I was scratching my head looking for a really good angle. And you know, maybe Mike, you could do something with your hair. <laughs> Bring a fire with or something. I don't know. Um, you know, get into more battles with your colleagues. That would that would make the story so much better because we all know that these are the traits of compelling characters. So again taken from a writing workshop website. They have to act in surprising, contradictory ways. You have to be misfits, have humanizing flaws, exceptional abilities that really are not appreciated by the world. And it, there's that thing of someone wants something badly and is having trouble. <laughs> All right. Um, but I think, you know, there, there are clearly dire abuses of this in science writing. I think one of the most egregious examples that I've seen is the horrible, truly terrible, awful book, and let me tell you how I really feel, but by the celebrated journalist Tom Wolfe about um, the intellectual battle between a uh, linguist called Daniel Everett and Noam Chomsky. So what he's done is basically taken these characters, and they almost serve as plots for an overcoming the monster story. Uh, and we have this epic battle that's being fought. But within this book, be incredibly uncurious about the actual ideas that the scientists are fighting about. So I'm just going to pull a quote that pushes my buttons. <laughs> Writing about an experiment done by um, the uh, researcher Tecumseh Fitz. Fitz had devised a test by which, he, by which he somehow, it was all highly esoteric and super scientific, could detect whether a person was using context-free grammar 
by filming his eye movements while a cartoon monkey moved this way and that on a computer screen accompanied by simple audio. So, of course, I take objection for this because, first of all, Fitch did not devise this. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's not all highly esoteric and super scientific. It's not that difficult to explain how the use of eye movements is showing something revealing about the human mind, but Tom Wolfe has absolutely zero interest in relating that. He's really after the, the narrative and the story. So, for me, some of the greatest sources of inspiration have not been these great stories and epic battles in science, but I often look to writing by really good essayists in any domain, and they take a very different approach. So I want to um, share with you a quote by Chris Arthur that, um, until I came across it, I've really been struggling with how to articulate this, so he does this beautifully. So he writes, Instead of the strategic assemblage of location, character, and action, the systematic setting of the scene within which things unfold, the piece-by-piece -piece unveiling of the story whose hooked beginning caught us at the outset on the barbs of its intriguing promise, I take single pieces of life's puzzle and lean the weight of reflection upon them until they're pulverized, then ponder the dust particles how we're wedded to them, how they're threaded through us, how they create unnoticed galaxies in the unlikeliest of places. Now, I find this really inspires. So I think um, story is not the only way that you can create coherence. And often, that coherence can come not from a narrative arc imposed from the outside on top of the science, but from the scientific subject itself. So I find it really useful to think of my science writing as a form of photography. Uh, this is a photograph by uh, the famous nature photographer Freeman Patterson, who creates really stunning images of the natural world. And I think his images reflect a, a very intimate knowledge and a really strong engagement with his subject. And I think that's what makes them beautiful, is that the image that he creates is not just a photograph of the thing he's looking at. It's also a photograph of the mind doing the looking. And one of the things he instructs his students to do is, before you take a photograph of your subject, really think about your subject and think about what is your emotional response to it? What is it that caught your eye about it? What makes it interesting to you? What else does it remind you of? And only then are you in a position to create a photograph that reflects the mind that's doing the looking. And when you do that, what you're capturing is the weight of your reflection leaning upon the subject. And I think that's an incredibly useful metaphor for thinking about science writing. This is very abstract, so let me try to give you maybe a more specific example of how I think that can actually be turned into a piece of writing. So, I was um, thinking about this on the plane on my way over here uh, with respect to a piece I'm thinking about writing about um, how kids learn words, a piece on the learning of names. <laughs> and I started investigating what do I find really interesting about how babies learn words. And it really boils down to this, is that there's a tremendous amount of stuff happening inside the infant that we have no clue about until we start really poking at it. So for those of you who are parents, and if you think that your kids aren't hiding their inner lives from you until adolescence, let me tell you, no one is as secretive about their inner lives as a baby. <laughs> They're doing all kinds of secretive things that you have no idea about. Uh, and this got me thinking that we often think of babies as the products of gestation. But really, they're doing a lot of gestating themselves. So then that kind of led to thinking about, well, how about if we represent this process from the perspective of a single word, say the word rabbit, and we look at the gestation of this word and how it changes shape within the mind of the child, right? hidden from view. So at the outset, it's this really blobby thing. It has no meaning attached to it. It's just a bunch of sounds that seem to adhere to each other that kind of get pulled out as something solid out of the liquid of language. 
And then eventually maybe the child is registering that this little blob of sound has oh, look, little features on it, maybe like little budding limbs. Um, so for instance, it has stress on the first syllable, not the second. And there are other words in the language that also seem to have stress on the first syllable, not the second. Others that have stress on the second, not the first. So there's this glimmering that there's something different about these. And then eventually there's attempts to link that to meaning. So there's the noticing that this little blob of sound gets uttered in conjunction with parents and people interacting with me in the context of, say, this soft, furry toy that I see. And then the child gets much more sophisticated and eventually comes to the realization that um, this bit of sound is used not just that it appears uh, in contexts that are sort of specific. So it appears together with other sounds like the or a uh, or some. Right? And that doesn't happen with words like Julie. Ah, uh, and what's noticeable about these two kinds of words is some of these words pick out uh, unique thing in the world, like Julie. But other words that come together with sounds like the or some seem to be doing something more complicated. They seem to be referring to classes of things, like not just this rabbit, but a kind of thing that we're going to call rabbits. And then we have to figure out, what is the kind of thing we're going to call rabbit? Does that include squirrels? Does that include mice? And eventually, when this gets narrowed down, to a much more specific concept, we have something that is born, something that begins to resemble <coughs> a person, or what we might call a word in this analogy. But that word is still very young. It's essentially uh, a receptacle for new knowledge. Um, so once we have the concept of rabbit linked to this word, we can now use it as a vehicle for figuring out that how rabbits have certain properties, like they have long ears, or rabbits are related to those unbearably cute little creatures in the Rocky Mountains called pikas. <laughs> uh, so this is kind of the space that thinking from this starting point um, can take me and give me some useful things to work with. And notice that there's no story arc here. There's development, yes, but there's no rising action. The plot is very flat, just the gradual transition from one stage to the next, just like you would witness an embryo turning into a fetus and eventually being born. There's no real drama here that we might think of as a story. Um, so I find that personally extremely useful. Um, and I, I want to um, pull, pull out some words from someone I think who has also been able to mine his uh, sense of connection to his subject material in his own work, in the words of Richard Feynman, who um, did an interview in which he said something very interesting. He related the story. He says, I have a friend who's an artist and has sometimes taken a view which I don't agree with very well. He'll hold up a flower and say, look how beautiful it is, and I'll agree. And then he says, I, as an artist, can see how beautiful this is, but you, as a scientist, take this all apart and become it becomes a dull thing. And I've heard that so many times. And I think he's kind of nutty. First of all, the beauty that he sees is available to other people too, and to me too. I believe, although I might not be quite as refined aesthetically as he is, I can appreciate the beauty of a flower. But at the same time, I see so much more about the flower than he sees. I can imagine the cells in there, the complicated actions inside, which also have a beauty. I mean, it's not just a beauty at this dimension, at one centimeter. There's also beauty at smaller dimensions, the inner structure, also the processes, the fact that the colors in the flower evolved in order to attract insects to pollinate it is interesting. It means that insects can see the color. It adds a question. Does this aesthetic sense also exist in the lower forms? Why is it aesthetic? All kinds of interesting questions which the science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower. It only adds. I don't see how it subtracts. And I really resonate with that view. Um, that, and that's something that I'm really working hard to try to communicate in my own work. So I think this is what we as scientists have to offer the world that no one else does. 
I think we can invite other people to step into our minds with us, to see what we see that's not apparent to others. To do that, I think we have to invite readers into our own individual, obsessive, and idiosyncratic minds. We have to have the confidence, too, that, to feel that even when the world thinks it hates expertise, that actually it can be riveted by it when it's invited to be on the inside with us and not on the outside. So I'm going to leave you with more words that I love by Robert Brinkhurst. When you think intensely and beautifully, something happens. That something is called poetry. If you think that way, poetry gets in your mouth. If people hear you, it gets in their ears. If you think that way and write at the same time, then poetry gets written. But poetry exists in any case. The question is only, are you going to take part? And if so, how? trying to get to the bottom of some question, but thinking beautifully, what? I think that depends on you. Um, I think we all have some sense of what our aesthetic is uh, when it comes to intellectual life. So uh, we often have a response to some idea that seems beautiful. And then the challenge is to communicate what we find beautiful about that. So the, the beauty is in the complexity and the richness, the fact that we're uh, in that thinking, relating to the world and the way that the world is structured, our thinking is somehow reflecting that structure of the world. And if we manage to com get, communicate that, I think that's a very powerful thing. So thinking about the communication, not about the subject matter, the beautiful part. No, I would, I would argue it's thinking about your subject matter. I mean, I would not advocate taking that quote absolutely literally because I don't think it's enough for you to simply think about your subject matter and speak at the same time. I take that rather metaphorically. Right? Uh, instead, I think the challenge is to craft your language in a way that is able to capture the structure of that thought that in a way that can relate to other people. So that last little bit of just the simultaneity of the thinking and the speaking, I don't subscribe to in a very literal way. But I think there's something about the idea that you're making a connection between the language and the structure of your thought that is, is successful. Yes. Uh, thanks, Julie, for a beautiful lecture. And uh, I think I, I really admire this push of you know bringing scientific content to a much broader audience. But I think you know other than the aspects you've discussed, I think there's an intrinsic difficulty is. I think for scientists, the writing piece is an objective vehicle. People try to align themselves, the, their opinion, away from their scientific finding, right? But we don't want it to, you know, get all the rigorous and in you know, the data just so that people think it's our personal opinion. So I think that's why people use a lot of technical jargon of to really like objectifying, yeah. to objectify their 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 discovery <laughs> or what have you. So uh, I think my question is just, you know. You know, as yes, we, we talk about our personal interpretation and all that in the discussion section of the paper, but I think it's really, really hard to do. Like, we don't want to disqualify our finding, and we, we do want to make it approachable by other readers, but without sacrificing, you know, sacrificing exactly. the So one of the things quality. I don't advocate, which some people do advocate, is that uh, scientists need to change the way they write their journal articles. Um, and that's a topic of discussion, especially now that we're talking a lot about open access issues, right? So some people are pushing the idea that really we need to train scientists to be writing in a way that it can be understood by a general audience. I don't take that view because I think that the purpose of scientific writing within that context is to communicate primarily with other scientists and that the language, yes, there are people who use it better and worse, but uh, the language has taken some of the forms it has for a reason, because it's effective 
And some of those things that you mentioned are absolutely part of it, that we objectify, we stand away from our own personal experiences and opinions. And I think that that plays a really important role. What I'm trying to suggest is that when your goal is to speak to non-scientists, it's a paradigm shift. And um, often, making this shift does put into conflict some of your values as a scientist and some of the values that a writer might have for you know, the techniques that they've learned to communicate with an audience in an effective way. Uh, and one of those absolutely is this issue of how much do I personalize? How comfortable am I doing that? Uh, and I think everyone's going to arrive at a different solution. Uh, that answer is going to look different for different scientists. And I think that's why it's really healthy to have a lot of people in the scientific community grappling with this, because we're going to come up with a diverse array of answers to some of those conflicts that will appeal to different kinds of writers. Right? So there might be readers who really appreciate a much more objective, less personalized view of the science. Others who would want it to be absolutely personal, but even for you, if you're writing it in a fairly objective way, I think there's something to be said that if you locate the heart of what interests you, you will be in a much better position to communicate that, regardless of the style of language that you end up adopting. And it might not be anywhere near to, to what these examples show. So, yeah, I think there's a conflict to be grappled with. I agree with you. Right. And I think on top of that, there's also this issue with accountability. Because yes. when you write to a broader audience, you inevitably, you know, injecting your personal views, and you yes. don't want to, at the end of the day, backfire on you like he said, she said, you know, That's and right. it's like a law is a game of catch up, yeah. and uh, yeah. so. And I can tell you in my own writing that this is one of the things I worry about the most. I constantly feel like I've got my colleagues on my shoulders going like, yeah, but, but, that's an oversimplification, or but, no, there's this. And I have to make really deliberate decisions about where I'm okay oversimplifying, where I'm okay not doing, not okay doing that, what kinds of cues can I give to my reader that I am oversimplifying, um, you know, if I feel that it's not relevant to flesh out the whole story. And that's something that it's not easy to do. Um, and I'm not arguing that any of this can be acquired quickly. I'm just arguing that it's important to do and that it's worth devoting some real resources to. And again, not every scientist is going to want to take this on. Just like not every scientist is going to want to you know, develop an eye tracking technique or do any one of the many things that scientists do. But I think it would be good if we had some people in our community scientifically grappling with these questions and having discussions about what the appropriate answers are to them. Robbie. Yeah, um, I find, and I don't know what other people think, but there is an abundance of really great science writing out there. And I think that too. Yeah, I don't, personally, I don't find there's a shortage. There's a ton of really good science writing, uh, writers and writing uh, out there. So why do we need to do it? Um, <laughs> given that there's an abundance, why do we need to do it? See, the second question um, I had in mind is, you know, why does, um, it often feels like, you know, larger society, they hate science. Um, so. Okay. Um, is that a question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm working through. Okay. Uh, so why do we need to do it? I think um, that even when... I agree that there's a lot of really good science writing, but what I find a little frustrating is that much of it still takes a bit of an outsider view. So it's often a journalist who accompanies a scientist uh, for some period of time. Not in all cases, but often that's, that's true. And I think that there's just a range of content that's not making its way out there that has more to do with the process of science than the products of science. So a lot of the science writing really focuses on the products of science, the discoveries. I think it's really valuable, and this speaks to your second question about the world hating us, is that um, I think what the world doesn't see is um, the things we grapple with uh, as scientists, um, the uncertainties, the way that we continue to try to make our ways through uncertainties, the failures of science how we try to improve on the failures of science. Um, and those kinds of accounts, I think, aren't making their way to the world. So it's not just about 
you know, the discoveries and the, the battle of ideas. It's also about uh, what makes up the daily life of a scientist. What are their small pleasures? Their, um, you know, the obstacles that continuously get in their way. Um, so I'd like to see more of that out there. This is one of the reasons why I think scientists should be engaged. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that maybe they'll hate us less if we do more of that. <laughs> yes. What happens when the imposition of narrative is not only the imposition of beauty, but the imposition of the wonder that draws on the science, like, like Gota, he, his theory of optics is schlack, but he it came from how much he loved the world. Yeah. He's a Newtonian, and he, and he was developed by someone who didn't see color. Where does that fall on that spectrum? Okay, so you guys are scientists. You have been grappling with this a lot, right? So, I mean, how many of you have loved the beauty of an idea? and then sometimes have some conflict with the beauty of that idea and the evidence that you're seeing not supporting that. So you already have some tools for what to do when that conflict arises. You don't have to be like John Degada who says, look, to make something interesting, we have to disregard this. That's uh, you know, a tension that's coming up already in your work. And as scientists, we absolutely have the value of being true to what we see out there as the evidence given the best of our abilities. So just take those skills and do that with the story and reject stories that make that not able to be reconciled and look for some other way of expressing the ideas that is more compatible with what you see as the evidence or the truth. Mike. So I was really happy to struck the times I've heard you talk about um, your discomfort with the putting things into simple narrative structures uh, and how that can distort things. And it just occurred to me that, and I'm curious about your thoughts about this, is actually a real, potentially really interesting essay one can write on that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, mm. you could write on that, <laughs> but uh, in the replication crisis, replication renaissance, however you want to refer to it, uh, one of the people who was presented as you know, having done work that created it was Daryl Ben. Yeah. But Daryl, something that I, I, I think Simonson or Simon pointed out, so if you Ben wrote a, a chapter on how to write a, a journal article, which essentially is an invitation to say what you're telling a story. And when you look at the consequence of, of what seems to be advice about good writing, that it in fact reinforced a lot of the yep. things that led to the problems with the replication crisis. Now, bridge to science writing that is oversimplifying to tell a story, bridge to the stories we tell in our, you know, in our, in our tribes, right? And in some sense, there, there is a, how did science then deal with this? And how do we, how does science writing deal with this? But in, how does the broader public deal with this, and so there's, there's kind of an interesting yeah. uh, convergence of these things, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's right. So one of your points is that we already have values of storytelling within the scientific community that have the capacity to distort. And actually, that essay has been written by me. Um, <laughs> maybe a place where the passive structure is not so appropriate. I, I actually wrote it um, for an audience of writers. Uh, there's a lot of debate in the genre of creative nonfiction about how faithful you need to be to details, factual details, uh, when they seem to conflict with your aesthetic goals. Um, so I wrote with that audience in mind, but one of the things I did was draw in scientists as an analogy, and I talked about how scientists tell stories too, we call them theories. And we also come across this issue of sometimes the stories don't quite fit with the facts. What do we do about that? Well, the answer to that is tell a better story. Um, I'd be happy to share that essay with you. Yeah. It's not it's not available online anywhere. Uh, it appeared in a magazine that uh, is not accessible to people who don't subscribe to it. Uh, but yeah, I'd be happy to pass that along and 
post it wherever you like. Great. Yes. I would like to know, I've been trained in a tradition intellectually that you seek simplicity, whether it's for the general public or for a scientific community you're writing to, because it brings clarity, it brings so many benefits, and even, you know, um, citability, if you wish, right, like among yeah. other benefits. But the thing that we have always grappled in a group of writers, and we had a cohort, we called it Thesis Anonymous, and we addressed some issues, mm -hmm. was well, simplicity is very often equated, especially if you're a woman, uh, with a lack of expertise. And mm -hmm. how do you balance that coming across as an expert and being approachable, not alienating, right? If you have any insights. Well, that's an interesting twist I haven't thought about, the sociological implications of simple language and what inferences people make from that. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to take that away and think about it, but um, I mean, my, my personal approach would be um, to not uh, worry about that possible inference by making your language seem less simple just for the reason of trying to appear expert. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, simplicity is, is a, a notion I think about a lot because I actually am someone who's attracted to complexity. Um, and that's something that I think makes its way into my writing. Um, the challenge is that how do you make complexity accessible to people who don't have the same starting point as you? And how do you get people to enjoy the complexity that you're able to enjoy? And they don't have the same starting point as you. So I, um, you know, I don't have this notion that everything needs to be simple, but there needs to be an entry point that the reader can come into. Maybe indirectly, that's a way of addressing this issue. But I, again, I think anything that that you do to dress up the language that you would otherwise want to be using out of fear that you will be perceived because you're a woman as less expert. I don't know, I think the only antidote that I can think of about that is just to continue doing your work well and just keep doing it well. You know, and That's maybe a, a pathetically weak answer, but I'm going to have to think about that a lot more. I really have not put together that sense of simplicity and its gender-based inferences. Yes, exactly. Do you think we need um, new venues to communicate ourselves? Yes. Yes. So absolutely. how do we compete for people's attention to communicate our stories to them? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to list all the ways we can do that, but what I would like to see is um, the academic culture taking seriously the enterprise of communicating uh, to non scientists or even, as I was speaking with Wednesday this morning, about scientists communicating to other scientists who have different starting points. Uh, I think one of the things that's happened is we've become so specialized because of the proliferation of knowledge, but that's kind of backed us into a corner. And now we need to really think about the tools of communication that we can bring that knowledge outside of our little corner, whether it's to other scientists or to the public at large. We absolutely need more than you. And I would love to see us as a community start brainstorming about what those might look like. Yeah, yeah they're not going to be created for us. We can tell you that. Well, I was just sort of thinking, you know, there are lots and lots of really great, for example, podcasts and blogs out there where people are, you know, doing a pretty good job of communicating really interesting ideas yeah. in a really exciting way. Um, but, you know, it's reaching the people who already are seeking that out. But one yeah, of the goals exactly. I think, that you presented is uh, countering these stereotype narratives that yeah. we have that pervade, uh, pervades this, in society. Um, and to do that, it seems like you have to figure out how to wait, a way to let these new ideas start to creep in and exactly. erode the stereotypes that are out there. Exactly. And I, I don't know quite how to do yeah. that. Well, you know, I think the, like if you do that through a medium like podcasts, for example, that's, that's one source of dissemination, right? So you, what you're doing is putting out into the world an alternative way of articulating um, the work or the experience of science. 
And the more alternatives are out there, the more weight they carry against the prevailing stereotypes. So yeah, it's, it's uh, I think, a, a process of seeping into the culture and finding ways that we as individuals can do that. It's not an easy task, but I think um, you know, it's a collective effort for sure. And that's, I think, the only way you have to change a culture is just by affecting the environment immediately around you that you can, you know, cause to lead in one direction or another. And then if enough of us are doing that, then that begins to change the culture in that direction. Yes? When you are sort of navigating these difficult choices about where it's appropriate to oversimplify when you're communicating, uh, do you have broad guidelines that you rely on in making those decisions? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in, in our sessions tomorrow for those of you who are planning to be here. But I, I kind of have a checklist I work through. And um, actually, um, you know, it really boils down to making a deliberate choice and constraining that choice. So one question is, once I identify, okay, there's a little bit of a gap here between what I'm saying and the full story, I think, how impactful is that gap? How important is it for the reader to have access to all these details? And that answer will really change depending on what my goal is. So um, if my goal is to provide a patient with concrete advice, that's pretty impactful. Okay, so I better really make sure that I am not omitting something that will help them make a decision that they need to make. But if my goal is just to lay the foundations for thinking about something that I'm now going to elaborate on over here, maybe that's less impactful because what I'm really doing is just creating a scaffolding of thought. And it's not so, you know, it's maybe will detract from my primary goal over here if we spend too much detail and energy elaborating it over here. So these are some of the kinds of things I also try to consider what's my audience? How likely is it that they're going to be? misled by this oversimplification? Do they have a set of existing biases that I'm doing nothing to address here? Or are they just you know, blank slates? Or are they sophisticated enough that they can infer that this is probably an oversimplification, especially if I could flag it with just you know, a simple way like, one theory is blah. Right? And if I have a sophisticated audience, they're comfortable with the idea that, OK, there are multiple theories, and I'm now situating you within this theoretical so no one easy answer, but I just try to think of that as deliberately as I can without becoming paralyzed and knowing that I'm not going to always get it right and just keep trying to do better. Yes? I mean, one obvious obstacle to more of us doing this is time. Right? Of course. It's clear, yeah. clear with compete with our of course. You know, primary uh, activity like research or teaching. Yeah. And you yourself had to choose between, I or did. chose actually, between one. Well, what are your thoughts for you know, actually bringing more scientists, or getting more scientists to do you know, the kind of writing that you think you yeah. should be doing, and letting them be scientists at the same time? Do, do, do you see institutions that have managed that in, in, in some ways that allow for scientists to do that? Um, not fully, but I think that there are some starts. So one thing I would say outright is that uh, uh, not everyone has to do this. Right? So again, it's something that would be good to have some scientists to work with. And the degree of ambition that you adopt will be situated within your own preferences, aptitudes, desires, interests. Um, so some people might be really passionate about the idea of doing work that is kind of transformational in the genre of science writing. Other people might adopt the much more modest goal of don't alienate your audience. You know, when you're in the position of doing an interview or presenting your work you know, in a publication like Scientific American, here are some basic techniques that will allow you to disengage from your stylistic, you know, acquired stylistic traits of scientific writing and maybe use a style of language that's a bit more transparent. That alone is a huge accomplishment. That can be done much more efficiently in a shorter amount of time but some of these more ambitious goals will take a real dedication of resources. Uh, one of the things, Mike and I were just at a, um, a workshop on interfaces between science and the public at the University of Connecticut. And they have in place a training grant that brings in a person who is skilled in communicating science. 
and he works with the graduate students in developing some of these skills. And apparently they've already seen, you know, side effects of this even within their own academic lives. They give clear presentations, they find it easier to communicate across disciplines. Um, so some of these are very useful even just within the scientific context. Um, I mean, if universities really took it seriously, they would be, of course, devoting resources to make this possible, including for those people who are passionate about it, maybe thinking about adjusting expectations of what your job requirements are. So maybe you have teaching release, or maybe what you teach is in part based on science communication. Um, you know, these kinds of things. So yeah, I acknowledge absolutely the struggles of doing this in any kind of ambitious way within the current academic context. I'm hoping that as we think about the importance of this, that that pressure will also begin to sort of apply to university administrators who might see the benefits of doing that. Or funding agencies. I mean, do you or see funding like, agencies, like, absolutely. Like, and it's F4 yeah. impacts, for yeah. instance. It's like the only thing yeah. that comes to mind. I don't know how relevant it would even be to, to them in that category. I think it's very relevant to them. Um, I think a case could be made. Um, but um, there's all kinds of resources at NSF. So, for example, the NSF might fund a category of grants that is for people who want to write a book about their research. Uh, one of the difficulties I've had, I think, is that um, I feel I really would have benefited from working with an editor who understood some of the challenges of science writing and could help me kind of figure out where I wanted to go with that. Um, but those resources are expensive and they're not readily available even with the <coughs> publishers themselves. So a publisher typically won't say, oh, you've got great content here. You need some help in shaping this. Here's an editor who's going to work with you to develop the manuscript. But that's something that the NSF could fund. I think that would be very, very valuable. Um, you know, I also have a fantasy that universities might think about having a position in a department or division devoted to someone who is trained as in that field, but who also has significant experience of communicating outside, and who serves as a bridge person, who's able to synthesize a lot of the knowledge in that department, and communicate it and teach other people how to do that within the community. So I think there are very specific, concrete things that if we were committed enough to it, could be done to support the work of individuals, which we currently have a hard time doing on their own. Yes. Do you think there's any role for artificial intelligence or machine learning in just sort of translating oh. from from science writing to to general writing and back? Probably. And probably it can attack some of those more modest goals. Like the noun piles? Yeah, like the noun piles. <laughs> uh, certainly it can act as a, a good a copy editor, probably, flagging things. Uh, probably is not in a position for the most part, have the domain knowledge to make really sound decisions about all the final changes. But yeah, I think there is a role to play. Yeah. Yes, And I wanted to go back to the scientist to scientist writing a little bit, which I know it wasn't the focus, but something you said kind of struck me to matter there too. Like the challenge is a little bit the idea that oh, we're okay writing the way we are because we need to be objective. Because I'm, I'm struck by how often somebody, even a fourth year graduate student, really they have a conversation with them and they find it hard to know how another scientist really thinks. Yeah. Why are they doing the thing they're doing? Maybe this is a bias of the language and cognitive sciences. Maybe I'm overgeneralizing, but it's very glaring in, in those domains. Mm -hmm. That often we do have aesthetics. There are things of course. that and the debates are about what we find interesting rather than disagreeing about the facts. Yes. And yeah. that is not made clear in the writing and a lot yeah. of you know I actually recently read a thesis where somebody beautifully expressed at the end uh, how he entered the field thinking he wanted to decide this question about embodiment, right? And at the end, he understood there was actually no disagreement about it. <laughs> People just disagreed about which part of the question they thought was interesting. It was interesting. And I think okay. so. Yeah. We're letting ourselves maybe off the hook a little bit too easily sometimes and saying we're, being, we're doing this because we're being objective. No, we're actually not talking about some of the things that are true. Yeah, it's really interesting. When I think of some of the clashes that happen between scientific writing and other styles of writing, like literary writing, uh, I think that those clusters often apply just to 
what I see as our official records of science, and not to what ac scientists actually do when they speak amongst themselves. Um, so, for example, in literary writing, it's uh, often highly valued to uh, reach behind the evidence and make all kinds of connections, to connect this with that. Um, in scientific writing, we apply a lot of restraint. Um, and you know, we, we want to be really cautious about not overextending. But if you go out with a bunch of scientists over years, they're making these kinds of connections all over the place. They're speculating, they're playing, they're injecting emotion, um, and they're having all of these debates, as you say, at an aesthetic level. I remember having fierce debates with someone who basically said something to the effect of, this cannot evidence, I really don't want this evidence to be true, because if that were true, it would force the field in a direction that I'm just not interested in pursuing. <laughs> so we do have these emotional reactions that we often express to each other. I find it really interesting that we don't let that out in a public record. And I'm still kind of thinking, like, why not? Like, what is the danger of doing that? You know, what do we lose and what do we gain by maybe dropping the stance that we are a unified to that work as a collective community, we express ourselves without appealing to our individual preferences and responses. So yeah, that's something I've started thinking about. Okay, I think it's time to turn it loose. Thank you so much for your